Professor um, Robert Brown from Swainsboro's East Georgia College, where he is the, uh, would you say chairman? Chair of the Math and Science. The chair of uh, uh, Math and Science Division, um, and uh, has uh, a long interest and uh, a long involvement in the space program, and um, he's going to take us through um, some things that he knows firsthand uh, about that. Um, I'll say beforehand, if any of you are so moved to do it, um, two nights ago I showed Mom and Daddy the right stuff, the, um, the movie from the, uh, 1984 about the, uh, the first stages of the astronaut program, and if anybody would like to borrow it fr uh, from me after this, to, just to, right movie. To, to refresh yourself on that, I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be glad to lend you my copy. Um, do come on in. There's another good movie called October Sky. Uh, October Sky is, is uh, one that's available locally. Have you seen the, um, the recent documentary, The Shadow of the Moon? Yes. Um, which is, is also wonderful. It's um, all the astronauts who would participate, and there are about a dozen of them sitting around shooting the breeze about, uh, or telling the same stories over and over again, but having a really good time doing it while they show footage of the, um, of the launches. Um, so, um, Professor Brown is, um, is going to speak, I think, mostly from a seated position because of a wrenched knee, but um, it sounded to me like his voice is going to carry Can you hear me okay? Time. <clears throat> I was in uh, Washington last week uh, on a conference and uh, went up a little earlier to have to spend a weekend with my cousin in Alexandria. She's right down about five miles from Mount Vernon. and. Uh, Going down the stairs in her apartment, uh, I slipped down about three feet, wrenched my knee. So it's better if I sit down. You want to go ahead? Sure. Okay. Uh, I am uh, a native of Lyons, Georgia. Grew up in Lyons, just down the road, and. Basically what I'm going to do is show you a history of technology. Obviously I can't tell you all the history of technology. But basically I'm going to talk about the history of technology as seen through the eyes of a Toombs County native son, so to speak. I uh, grew up in Lyons and went to this Lyons High School. Some of you may have seen it before it burned down. And it was in this high school that uh, Several things happened. Um, back in uh, when I was about 12 years old, I was a ham radio operator. Mm -hmm. I believe Moe's here was a ham radio operator. That's me when I was about 12 years old. My call sign was K4SEO. And some of the equipment you see here I built. And uh, some of it was an army surplus. <laughs> I remember coming home from like the eighth to ninth grade and uh, getting on my ham set and talking to people all over the world. And one of the things I 
begin to think of then was basically people were about the same everywhere. I never ever thought there would be anything like the internet where everybody with a computer and a high speed connection could see what was happening all over the world. And uh, it was just absolutely amazing how technology has taken us from the 50s. This was in the late 50s when I was uh, a ham radio operator. Uh, and how technology has taken us to so many different places. Now, in 1957, In 1957, I think you guys remember this. Uh, sometimes when I talk to my students, I show them this, and some of them really haven't heard much about Sputnik. But you remember that the Russians beat us into space with this satellite that really didn't do anything. All it sent was this annoying uh, t uh, tone down to Earth. And you know that right after that, we tried to put, put a satellite up, and uh, it uh, blew up, and it was called Flopnik. <laughs> Finally, about two months later, Werner von Braun, a German scientist that we uh, brought back to the U.S. after World War II, had gone to Huntsville, and he uh, had designed a, a rocket that put up Explorer 1. And it didn't do much either, but sent a little signal back. And the Russians later on put up one with a dog in it, and it didn't do anything, and the dog died. But I was really happy when I was a senior in high school in 1962 that Bell Telephone Labs, which was the research and development arm of AT&T, the entire Bell system, when it was, there used to be one Bell system for phones. They built Telstar 1 and Telstar 2 that it was about like this, and weighed about 300 pounds, and actually did something. And I'm gonna show you a historical film here. This is Bell Laboratories. There's a satellite. One Telstar bridge is a big pond. Command ops ready. Satellite is in the nose cone. Good evening, Mr. Vice President. This is Fred Campbell calling from the Earth Station at Andover, Maine. How do you hear me? You're coming through nicely, Mr. Campbell. That was the first telephone call ever made over a satellite. And Telstar 1 actually carried television signals between uh, New York and, uh, and England. They even broadcast the funeral of John F. Kennedy in 1963. Now, when I was at Lyons High School, I saw what Bell Laboratories was doing, and I developed a dream of somehow maybe working for Bell Laboratories or getting into the space program. At that time, there was a big push to educate more people in math and science at a faster pace, and I basically said, well, I want to go to Georgia Tech. I set my heart on doing that. And we had a, uh, a lot of folks who encouraged me back in Lyons High School. But back then, we didn't have a lot of college prep courses like calculus. So I was uh, afraid that I might flunk out of tech, even though I was, you know, was making good grades. So back then, you could get on a Greyhound bus and go anywhere you wanted to, even when if, if you were 16. So one day, one Saturday, my mama let me go on a Greyhound bus to Georgia Tech. That's when I was a junior in high school. And I uh, found the Georgia Tech bookstore and bought a calculus book and then started teaching myself calculus because I wanted to sort of get ahead of the game because I knew if I got up there and was behind the game, I might not uh, be able to do as well. So I taught myself the first two courses in calculus. But I did it slow at my own pace. 
So I went to Georgia Tech and was uh, lucky enough to make good grades and get invited to get into a PhD program the minute I got my bachelor's. So I graduated uh, with a PhD in 1971. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven <laughs> when Bell Telephone Laboratories, the company that had built Telstar 1 and Telstar 2, gave me a job. And uh, at that time in 71, it was getting towards the end of the Apollo program, and they were, NASA was not hiring, but Bell Telephone Labs, <coughs> who had designed and built and launched the first, Telstar, the first communication satellite, gave me a job. And this is a location as seen from the air. It was the largest laboratory, private laboratory in the world. There were 6,000 employees there. And I uh, basically got my wife in a little car and drove to New Jersey and lived there for the next 25 years. This is also another view of, of the laboratories, another view of the laboratories inside. The, um, Water tower you see there has three legs, like the three uh, leads on a transistor. Probably you guys remember what a transistor is. And trans you remember transistor radios that came out sometime in the 50s. Well, Bell Laboratories invented the transistor, and their scientists, the three scientists that did it, got the Nobel Prize for physics. In fact, Bell Laboratories has more... Nobel Prize winners in any other private laboratory in the world. This is actually a place close to where I lived. You may, I, I, I could tell you a lot of other history, but it was in this location that in about 1969, two years before I got there, the uh, background radiation of the Big Bang was discovered. And Arno Penzias and um, Bob Wilson, a couple of colleagues that I knew got the Nobel Prize for Physics uh, later on in about 1977. There had been a uh, theory that if there was a beginning of the universe, that there would have been a Big Bang. And the theory said there would be a background radiation Nobody had ever discovered that until these guys did in about 1969. This was the first project that I ever worked on, and it was described in Time Magazine in 1971. We were going to put a quarter of a million telephone calls through this two-inch pipe. We would have to bury it in the ground uh, all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast. It worked great. Um, <clears throat> this is Harry, a guy who ultimately worked for me after I became a manager. And that's me in the back, and we we're testing the first system, and it would carry 230,000 digital voice channels. We thought it was going to be the best thing since sliced bread. But what happened was, it worked great, but fiber optics, which you may have heard of, and satellites and other technologies supplanted this system. We only built 20 miles of it, okay? So I was pretty happy. Well, let me show you another couple of things. You may have heard of Unix, the Unix operating system, which uh, probably Unix and Linux are the two most used operating systems on the internet now. The guy who invented that was Ken Thompson. I worked with him. And then the guy who invented C programming language, Dennis Ritchie, I worked with him also. This was my first computer that I ever had. And if you got anybody here has bought a computer lately, you know that you would buy it with about a thousand or two thousand megabytes of RAM. Well, mine only had .012. But that was back in 1971. I finally got to work on satellites, and here is a news uh, report on, on uh, some work we had done in research to try to get 
more telephone signals and more uh, video signals over a satellite, and we were able to quadruple the yield of the satellite. And this is me with a little less gray hair with a few people in my group. Now, I thought I had died and gone to heaven again when in 1977 they asked me if I would lead the group to design the payload for Telstar 3, the successor to those small satellites you saw. And uh, I said, sure, I'll do it. I may even pay you to let me work on it. This satellite, instead of being 300 pounds, was 18 feet tall, weighed 3,500 pounds, and had to be launched on the space shuttle. By this time, the space shuttle was available, and we wanted to use it, so we began to work with the astronauts and work with NASA. And there in the back seat, we had a back seat on the shuttle, Telstar um, 3D. This is where our satellite sat. And you probably remember back in those days, we weren't sure the shuttle was going to make it you know, on time to launch our satellite. So we went out to California and I actually sat in the pilot seat and uh, we looked at the problems they had with the tiles on the bottom of the shuttle. Now, something's going on here. Okay, I think it was trying to connect to your network. Okay. I was trying to connect to the library network a while ago, and then I think it was still trying to do it. some things going on it doesn't like. <laughs> Let me disconnect from the network. Your library network is wondering if I'm trying to do something to it. So I'm going to disconnect from it. Okay, now we can go ahead. There's a shuttle. And this gives you an idea of what the shuttle looked like compared to some other rockets you may have heard about. In 1969, when man went to the moon, they went on a Saturn V rocket. And these two are Saturn V rockets. One, <coughs> the one here uh, on the left is the one they went on. And the one on the right was a Saturn V rocket that put up Space Lab. But this is the one they traveled to the moon on. And here you see the shuttle system. And uh, this is, back here in the back is where Telstar 3 went. Now, this is a Telstar 3 shuttle team we worked with. This is Michael Coates on the left. He was the um, uh, commander of the shuttle. On the right, the lady is Judy Resnick. She had a PhD in electrical engineering, just like me. And she was the one who put our satellite up in 1984 out of the shuttle. Unfortunately, she died two years later in the Challenger disaster. And uh, my heart sank when I saw that. I remember sitting in a restaurant and seeing, hear, hearing that it had blown up on launch. This is a shuttle system. Um, this is the liquid fuel tank that carried all the fuel Plus, even that wouldn't do it. They had to have two solid rockets that you see on the side to give enough thrust to get the shuttle up. This is a picture of the shuttle getting ready to launch. And right back in the back here is my satellite. Now, we had spent about three years designing and building the satellite and testing it. Chain is armed. Sounds pressure water system is active, being activated. 
camera that was put up on the shuttle looking back at Earth. The shuttle is going to take the satellite up to about 150, 200 miles above Earth. And uh, it will have to go 17,500 miles an hour before it can break free of gravity and go into orbit. So that's how fast it's got to go to go into orbit. There you can see the Atlantic Ocean. Miles per hour. Altitude 12,000 feet. This is a view from a camera mounted on Discovery's external fuel tank. Three engines on Discovery are now throttling down to two thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass through the area of maximum air pressure and go supersonic. Now you'll see in just a second the two solid rockets come off. They'll burn up. One of the missions launched Discovery speed now 900 miles per hour. Discovery, Houston. It's still going pretty slow. Discovery, Discovery. Altitude 9. All systems remain go for Discovery. Altitude now 9 miles, 6 miles northeast of the launch pad. Just One and a half minutes since launch, Discovery's already consumed more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant. It weighs less than half of what it did at liftoff. Speed now 2,000 miles per hour. Now it's 18 about miles, 14 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Standing by now for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. Now you see the two solid rockets coming off on each side. They've been used up. Booster officer confirms clean separation of the solid rocket boosters. Discovery now on its three main engines, second stage. Speed now 3,030 miles per hour, altitude 33 miles, 40 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. And it's going to go on to be 17,500 miles an hour, and it goes into orbit. You can see it in orbit here, and here's the Earth in the background. And what you're going to see here is my satellite being deployed from the shuttle by Judy Resnick, the, the lady you just saw, the lady astronaut. Oops. Now what you see is this as the Earth on the left, you see the shuttle here, and you see the satellite spinning up. The antenna on top of the satellite is folded down. It'll be deployed once we get it into final orbit. Now, if you know something about communication satellites, they're not at 200 miles above the Earth. They have to be at 22,300 miles above the Earth. Does anybody have a DISH network anywhere at home? Yes. How many have a DISH? Some of you may have a DISH. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, my group helped put up the first two DISH network satellites, but that was a few years later. But <clears throat> they have to get to 22,300 miles out in space at that orbit the satellite will go around the Earth once per day, and of course the Earth turns once per day, and therefore it appears to be stationary above the Earth. Therefore, if you have an antenna in your backyard, you don't have to move it as the satellite moves, 
because the earth is moving with it. That's why we put this rocket motor on the bottom of our satellite. As soon as the shuttle moves out of the way, we're going to fire that and send it into an orbit 22,300 miles up. Doctor, does GPS work the same way? GPS satellites? Uh, they, they no. Same altitude? GPS satellites are about 700 miles up, and they're, I'd have to Google it, I think they're about 17 to 25 of those, and they're constantly circling the Earth. Okay. So that if you're in your car, uh, you need to see at least three satellites to get your location. But uh, basically, that's the way they work. I've actually got some videos on that too. In the next scene, you're going to see Judy floating around in the shuttle, communicating with the satellite, making sure it gets out correctly. The communication satellite is deployed by Judy Resnick and photographed by Mike Mullane. See her floating around? We sent an IMAX camera up into the shuttle, and after they shot the footage, we even had Walter Conkright, you heard his voice, uh, announcing what was going on. But here's the shuttle, here's the, the, uh, the satellite with a rocket engine in the back. Shuttle's going to move out of the way, and we're going to put it into orbit. We're watching a lot of smiles down here. Yeah, a lot of up here, too. So we put two of these up on the shuttle. And because the shuttle was a little late, the very first of them went up on a rocket. Now the satellites last 10 to 12 years, so in between designing and launching satellites, we designed satellite networks to use the satellites. And uh, this is a, uh, I was on a TV program in North Georgia when we were deploying satellites for the Georgia Farm Bureau. We did this back in about 19, 1986 or so, and basically put together a digital network, sort of like the internet, so that all the farm bureaus in all of the states could talk to one another. And this was when we were inaugurating that program. Now in 1993, I was real happy when they asked me to lead the entire team to uh, design, build, and deploy the Telstar 4 satellite, which is going to be even bigger than Telstar 3. This satellite, you can see the solar panels in blue here to provide power. It happened to be about 88 feet from tip to tip. The satellite weighed about 7,800 pounds and cost us $100 million per satellite. And by this time, since the shuttle had had these problems, we could not use a shuttle to put it up. The shuttle could not fly as often as we wanted to. So we had to buy some rockets. Uh, we bought some American rockets, some Atlas Centaurs, and they cost $100 million each. And we did three of these. So I had to do a lot of good mathematics, a lot of good testing, a lot of good science to make sure that this $600 million worth of uh, satellites and rockets would work. Where did all that money come from? All that money. Well, it, it came from AT&T uh, that I worked for. And of course our budget, at that time we were like a $70 billion company. That's what our revenues were when we used to have all of the long distance we used to uh, have all the local and, and just about everything. And of course, we've been broken up a lot of times. But this is a uh, rocket that we launched on in Cape Canaveral in 1993. Uh, it was an Atlas Centaur rocket, and up at the top is where we put the satellite. This is, we built this close to Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, this is me in a crazy suit here. You had to be real clean when you worked on these. In the back is a partially built satellite. This is my team that I was in charge of. One of the things I'd like to point out is 
when we hired people to do this, I could not find enough Americans that knew rocket science and mathematics and this technology. So we had an international team from India, from Pakistan, from Germany, this is me, this is a guy from China, this is an American, an American, a guy from uh, uh, Korea, an American, China, America, America, Egypt, Ethiopia, America, and India. One of the things I like to say is we are not educating uh, our students and getting them interested in how the world works and how mathematics works. And we, we've got a long way to go if we're going to, to stay up with China and India right now. This is uh, the, some pictures of how we were building the satellite. This is the very basis of the satellite with, uh, with fuel tanks, <laughs> oxidizer tanks, the propulsion system. Then we began to build the communication system. It literally took a large team to do this, a $100 million project with about three years to build it. And uh, I think there were two or 300 employees of what is now Martin Merritt or Lockheed Martin. At that time, it was Ford Aerospace. And uh, there's been quite a lot of changes in the aerospace industry in the last 10 or 15 years. But here we are building everything. Here is a picture of my last boss before I left New Jersey. He was Terry Hart, he was an astronaut. He came to the laboratories about the same year I did. He was a mechanical engineer. I was an electrical engineer. He had been a pilot, so he volunteered to try to get into the astronaut program, and lo and behold, he was successful. He went off on a couple of shuttle missions, then came back and led the business part of the satellite venture, and I led the technical part. Now, as I said, uh, we couldn't get enough uh, American rockets all the time. So we went to the French and paid $200 million for two of their rockets. And the French launch from French Guiana, which is right off the equator down in South America. Turns out the closer to the equator you are, the less energy it takes to get one of these rockets and satellites to go around it. Now, here the satellite is sort of all bundled up, ready to go into the nose cone of the rocket over here. These are the solar panels folded up, and here's the antennas folded up. And here, I'm gonna show you the launch we had in French Guiana. Uh, and I was the spacecraft director at this particular time. <laughs> such as ABC, PBS, and Fox depend on Telstra. These were the companies to that used our satellite. ...to network affiliates and member stations across the United States. The Telstar family also transmits programming for major broadcast syndicators, as well as major cable programmers who deliver directly to the home. And AT&T and PBS have teamed together to create an exclusive distance learning neighborhood providing lifelong learning opportunities to students of all ages via satellite from anywhere It's a tricky operation, and it is, it is a mammoth building. I think it's 8,000 tons. Now this is the French rocket called the Ariane. 3,000 tons. 3,000 tons. It's 18 meters <coughs> high. It's still very heavy, though. Still very heavy. The biggest uh, metallic structure ever built in uh, Europe, if one counts French Guiana as being Europe. One of the first tests after our... We're basically checking the satellite out and make sure it's ready to go into space, because once you get it up there, you can't go get it. Rival was the pit check between the spacecraft and the Ariane flight adapter. Mechanical and electrical checks were conducted by the Martin Marietta and Ariane Spas teams. Martin Marietta Astrospace conducted its spacecraft electrical checks, thoroughly verifying correct operation before proceeding to the propulsion system testing. There's, system test there's green mm -hmm. lights everywhere. These were some of our customers that we flew down to South America. They wanted to watch the launch. That's at uh, nine seconds before the uh, 
liftoff time. Well, since these things, even uh, even when they are high tech, uh, they do have some drift. This you is don't want to release them too early to, load, right to, uh, to build up an error. So that's why you release them at the very last minute before launch. And of course, at minus five seconds, we will have uh, the opening, as we said before, of the uh, cryotechnic arms EMT. And this is Bob Brown, the Tesla 4 satellite program manager. And I can tell his wife Martha that he wants, her, wants to say hello to her. My wife is back in New York. Let's uh, watch the final sequence. A tous de Deleo. He's going to cap down the final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Satellite is right up here at the top. Allumage. And so our uh, Ariane is up and off on its 67th mission, a view of it rising seen by cameras here at the uh, launch site, and now seen by the infrared camera, which is situated on Royal Island, 15 kilometers off the coast here from Kourou. There's been vertical ascent for some 15 uh, seconds, and then the launcher tilts over to arc out eastwards across the Atlantic. Very clear view with this infrared camera where we see the entire launcher, not just the uh, billowing flames at the rear, but uh, we actually Ex see the thumb the bearing. So, so liquid strike on boost has just uh, stopped firing. At an altitude of uh, 42 kilometers, we should maybe then explain. Now the 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 parameters are normal. Now this, these are the two solid rockets coming off. We strap on, we're separated. The figures on the right then, very quickly, T the uh, time uh, and our launch, which lift the time for 360. Then the uh, first stage comes off, it's finished. The one time is already down the to second the stage. Uh, mass F -55. Was just at the start of this the is the uh, cocoon, which was protecting. Uh, then once we're above the atmosphere, we take the shroud off the satellite. Just to Delta say, 402 like, during the initial phase of the flight when it was passing through the dense atmosphere, which could have uh, created uh, friction and damaged it. And also, of course, from minus five hours when the launcher was uh, on the ground, uncovered with the uh, rain that we had today. The fairing uh, involves also a loss of mass. Yes, and of course, we're sitting down here wondering if this hundred, two hundred million dollar launch is going to work. And the third stage has started up. Now we have the uh, long burn time. The third stage starts to burn. Long burn time of this third stage cryogenic engine. Twelve and a half minutes of pushing to increase our speed. The station natal in Brazil raised the altitude. Uh, Lost. And what we're waiting for is for the burn to end, for it to go into orbit at 22,300 miles and to separate the satellite from the uh, rocket. Acquisition, but now we're picked up by uh, Ascension Island. And we're up to almost 8 kilometers per second. Yeah. 202 mile, 202 kilometers, pardon me. We might perhaps use this opportunity here to um, the dip. So here we're, we're listening to what's going on. We might use this opportunity to uh, to talk a little bit about the future up. for air and space. To separation. Separation del star. Then we got word that it's separated. Unleashed enthusiasm, relief of everybody here. Presiding Bob Brown. And behind them, the Martin Marietta. So now we're relieved, uh, we're beach. smiling. And, and, and we even the, get uh, some cigars from the French. Mission report. Now, 
Now you might wonder why in the world am I showing Jurassic Park when I'm talking about technology. Well it turns out that in 1993 when we built this satellite, it was the largest uh, com uh, commercial satellite ever launched. And Steven Spielberg, who was the director of Jurassic Park, had the idea that he might be able to send uh, his movies through the satellites to theaters. And so he called, he didn't call me, I don't know Steven Spielberg, but he called the uh, CEO of our company and asked if we would work on that possibility. So it took a lot of folks to look at really uh, high definition projectors, ways to send a lot of bandwidth through our satellite and do it efficiently. We worked on that part. And after we looked at the whole project, we added up all the costs, and it cost too much. Now that was in 1993. Now everybody here knows what has happened in the last uh, 10 or 15 years with technology. We're getting more and more transistors on a chip, uh, getting a lot of things done in just a small space. And now it's very possible to do this. In fact, several directors are already sending movies through the satellite to theaters. But you also know what's happening. Everybody's buying their big screen TV, right? And getting it directly from the satellite to their home. So who knows how long movie houses are going to be going on if everybody can have a very large screen, high definition TV. But we worked in 1993 on putting high definition television through satellites. And Jurassic Park had, was uh, in the theaters at that time. And so I told my students, you know, all kinds of things can be done with computer animation, and I talk about Jurassic Park and all the things that were done here. And so after Telstar 4, we, after we had uh, launched three of them, that was in 1995, I began to think of coming back home. And so I actually transferred within the same organization to Atlanta and stopped working on satellites after 25 years and decided to do research and development in high-speed fiber optics. By this time, the internet had gotten started and there was a need for very high-capacity uh, fiber optics to connect all the continents. So one of the things I worked on was what we call submarine fiber optic cables. If you look up here on the left, a fiber optic uh, fiber is the size of a human hair, about 250 millionths of a meter. Through that, we can get 20,000 million bits per second, 20 gigabits per second. Uh, at one time, we could only get about 50 megabits. So this made the internet possible. And when I first went to the lab down there, we had one cable under the Atlantic and one under the Pacific. And all of the new technology that was becoming possible, we began to lay cable that we designed in all the oceans and circle the continents. And that's why you can talk to anybody anywhere, anytime, just like it was next door. And I think uh, AT&T put in about a third of all of these. Now, after doing that in 1998-1999, I was sort of anxious to get back into the wireless world. You remember ham radio and satellites are wireless. So I went down to Georgia Tech, where, where Lucid and AT&T had a wireless network design. We were designing the first Wi-Fi. In fact, what we were working on 
was the Wi-Fi technology that goes in all your laptops now. In fact, some of my technology is in, is in this uh, uh, laptop. In fact, when we designed it, it cost about three or four hundred dollars in 1998 to, to put this in a laptop. Now, it's probably about twenty dollars or less. <coughs> One of the things I wanted to tell you that I was looking for software and hardware developers to help build this Wi-Fi equipment, and I could not find, no matter how hard I tried, enough Americans to do this. So where do you think I went? We didn't go to India because we could just pay $25,000 a year for a software developer. If it was if it was in the U.S., I'd pay them about 85,000 to 100,000 a year. We just couldn't find enough of them. So we went to India and uh, I got to visit the Taj Mahal, probably one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture I've ever seen. And uh, this is my team in Atlanta that tested and uh, delivered this technology to our customers like Dell, HP, Toshiba, probably we had most of the market at that time for the wireless, uh, uh, for the wireless technology. This is some of the stuff we, some of the equipment we delivered to Dell, and it's the same kind of equipment that's in this library right now, so people can connect wirelessly. In fact, this is Dell's own webpage selling our equipment. Now, and. In the year 2002, I decided it was close. It was time to get a little closer to home. I sort of sensed we were going to break up again up there in the, you know, in AT&T and in, in Lucid, and that my comp my part of my company might get sold. And indeed, it did <coughs> about two years after I retired. So I got out at about the right time after 31 years doing research and development, and had thought when I was in high school that someday I might like to come back to Toons County or, or a neighboring county and encourage students to get into math and science and technology. And so that's what I, I want to show you something else in just a second. I'm going to come back to that slide. But I'm basically home again. I came down here as a professor at East Georgia College about seven years ago. And about a year and a half ago they asked if I would be the chair of the math and science division. And I'm glad to be close to Toombs County, close to my home, and being here with all these great folks. There is a slide I wanted to show you that sort of says it all. When I first went to Bell Laboratories in about 1971, you guys have heard of transistors. And back then, Probably in about 1965, the chip was invented, okay, where you could get several transistors on a little chip. And one of the miracles that occurred was they were able to put these transistors on not some exotic uh, semiconductor, but plain old silicon, which is basically silicon dioxide is sand. It, to me, it was a miracle. We, the first transistor was put on germanium, which is sort of rare. Because we could put transistors on silicon, and sand is just about, is, it costs nothing. We could make chips cheap. The other thing that happened, AT&T Bell Labs and Intel, who you've heard of, that made the first computer chip, we're able to, year by year, increase the number of transistors on a little chip. It went from a few hundred or a thousand back in 1970. Here in the year 2008, we can get two billion transistors. It just blows my mind. That's why you can buy a GPS receiver for under $100. When I was building Telstar 3 in California back in 1977. In the same area, they were building the first GPS satellite, and it was going to be exclusively for the Navy. 
you know, for for navigation for for our ships. And a GPS receiver at that time was a huge rack of equipment that cost a quarter of a million dollars. And now I've got one in my pocket. I've got one in my car, and that's the way I found the library. I'd never been to the library here before. So I just put the address in there, and the satellite guided me to this talk. And a guy named Gordon Moore began to realize that technology was moving so fast, and you went from a, a few hundred to two billion. That's why computers are so cheap, and that's why people are getting connected so quickly all around the world. It's just transformed our society. And I think it's yearning for the good. And that's it. Anybody got any questions? Who encouraged you, uh, Dr. Brown, to, to... Who encouraged me? Yes. Because you started in such a I tell day. you, my mother, uh, plus some other teachers, uh, my mother's got an interesting history. She studied math at GSCW. She came down here and met my daddy in Lyons. Actually registered him for the draft. And he got drafted. And the last thing he did was, before he left for China in World War II, she got pregnant. And so I was born while he was in China. And however, when he was in basic training, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. She got a job with McDonnell Aircraft. She couldn't be an engineer, but she did some mathematics and did calculations for the engineers who were designing the first jet airplane ever to take off and land on an aircraft carrier. And she came, when, when, uh, when I was born, and by the time I was nine or 10 years old, she was showed me how to solve a few algebraic equations, simple ones, okay. So I just got enthralled with that. And I had some good teachers in Lyons High School, uh, Mrs. Merle Wilkes, I don't know whether you know her. And uh, she was my math teacher, and uh, Mr. J.H. Collins was my science teacher. And although we didn't have all the things that the big schools had, I had a lot of encouragement and uh, a lot of support. Plus there was a, um, Marion Carson, who was assistant postmaster in Lyons. He was a ham radio operator. He taught me how to be a ham when I was like 11 or 12. And that got me interested in technology. But a lot of people, I had a lot of persistence. Um, and I, I wanted to do this. So I worked on it and had a lot of help. We need for you to go around the schools and speak to young people to encourage them to. Yes. We really I, do. The I talk to a lot of young, a lot of students uh, at various clubs. I'll talk to anybody. I, I think I've got several other things we could talk about if we had time, but we need a transformation in this country about our attitudes Absolutely. about education, yes, about sir. working hard. Yes. Uh, about really studying. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think the sports is very is, is important, but I think this is is more important yeah. than sports to me. My yeah, I, I I enjoy sports, and I pull for Georgia Tech when they play Georgia. <laughs> but you know, it it matters nothing right. in the final analysis. Right. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is how we can educate our, our children. Uh, in, in fact, getting the whole world educated and brought together. There are all kinds of um, projects we could work on. But right now we want to buy better looking cell phones. You know, uh, all kinds of technology that's, that's interesting, but we could be using that to, to, to make peace. Uh, I sort of thought, my daddy was in World War II, it was a very rough war, okay? And I saw using these satellites that had a payload of something that would bring some peace and communication, as opposed to delivering a nuclear bomb. 
I saw this sort of biblically, and in, in, you look in Isaiah, it says, and they'll turn their swords into uh, plowshares and their spears into fish hooks. I saw this ICBM missile being turned into something for peace. So I thought that what I was doing was sort of helpful. And thank God we have never had to deliver a nuclear bomb anywhere. And I hope that it never happens. Okay. But uh, anyway. Have yeah, I talked too long? No, I don't. No, 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 no. <clears throat> yes. For, for what it's worth, I'm, I'm a teacher at Bailey High School. I teach economics and history. And, uh, and I was having a conversation with more students this very day about much of what you're talking about. The, uh, the lack of direction and the yeah. presumed lack of ambition. Sometimes and, uh, I think we get spoiled. Even mm -hmm. I can get spoiled, you know. We are so affluent, you know. Right. Uh, we need to restrain ourselves. Uh, questions that I had, and yeah. I guess they're related. First of all, uh, where do you see technology going with respect to satellites and, and uh, you know, the practicality of our technology? And, and more specifically, do you see any time coming up soon where Wi-Fi will stretch across the country, where we'll be able to drive across the desert and access the Internet on a laptop? Well, there will be some kind of wireless technology that will be available everywhere. In fact, it may not be Wi-Fi. But there's something called 3G, third generation wireless. Now you can go down and buy a uh, cell phone that can do about a megabit <coughs> per second, okay, if you connect through some of our networks. And uh, it's going to be even more, get even faster. Now you said some satellites, okay. Some, a lot of people don't know all the things the satellites have done for us. I've got another little presentation which I don't know that we could put in here tonight, it was another 20 minutes, about sort of the history of satellites itself. And it, it bodies weather satellites. You can't imagine the impact that weather satellites that are just uh, a couple of hundred miles up telling us what's coming. I know they can't tell us it's going to rain in five days from now for sure, but they're, that they, uh, we just couldn't do without them now. Then there are communication satellites, and now communication satellites basically send television. I love uh, to use uh, direct TV or uh, what's that, the Dish Network. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we were building Telstar 4, the guy who started Dish Network, who, who was pretty small back then, asked the labs if we would shepherd his two satellites through. So we were responsible for the first two dish networks, and now the guy's a billionaire. And um, I basically subscribe to anything that's worth anything. I get lectures from around the world, you know, being through the dish network. There's all kind of things for education and communication. Then there's the GPS. I tell you the story of the GPS. The first GPS receiver was a quarter of a million dollars, and, and now you can own your own. Okay, so I, I, I really believe that technology is going to take us a long ways. I believe the blind is going to be able to see, deaf are going to be able to hear. There are going to be things that we can't even imagine, okay, if, if we'll just work on them. What else? Will you come back and show us more? This is yeah. what, whatever you would like. Okay. I, I give a talk on why the world is flat. <laughs> have you have you ever seen the book by um, uh, Friedman, uh, the New York Times? I actually went down to Savannah and talked with him when he was giving a talk. And it, to me, it was a little funny because I could see the world was flat a long time ago. Uh, and he wrote this book, though about six or eight years ago. It's been really very well written, and. Um, how China and India are educating their kids better than we are, and they come over here and are so excited about math, so excited about science. The other day I registered a girl from Vietnam who had been a refugee here at one time, and she sat down there and said, Dr. Bram, I am so excited about learning mathematics. She wanted to take a double overload. She wanted to take two math courses at the same time. 
she wanted to take two biology courses at the same time. And by George, she made A's in it. But she said, I, I study all the time. Well, I don't think you have to study all the time, but your dog don't need to be serious about it. Yeah. When you brought those that team over from India because you couldn't find any to that forgotten which project it was, you said you would have paid them they would have made eighty five thousand a okay. year. Now most of them stayed in India. So they okay. made we brought about six of them to Atlanta and they, they lived in hotels for about a year or so. Uh, I'm not sure how much we paid them here. Uh, but it would have been about twenty-five, thirty thousand a year in India, and we had some American software developers sitting right there with them. And they were getting eighty, ninety thousand a year. Okay. Um, we, I came here to start a computer science and information technology program. We started one. We haven't gotten enough customers. There are not enough students in, in uh, Swainsboro that want to learn the hard mathematics. They don't want to do the homework. No, they don't. Okay. I heard uh, I substituted at the high school today, and I heard all day long that Connor, you're too hard. Yeah. Well, to, to get out of my calculus class, they've got to know it to a certain level. They might have to be geniuses. Okay but they need to know it to a certain level, and I will help them all I can. My office is always open, and uh, and some of them take advantage of it. I've got a good student back here, and I know he's gonna do well. He just joined my calculus class this week, right? Yes, sir. Okay, you, gonna, you doing your homework? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? Can you see where this is going to take us in medicine? Ooh. I don't know a whole lot about medicine. But you have to But uh, you heard of nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you, chips, the transistors we put in chips are like microns away from each other. Okay, that's a myth of uh, a meter. We're talking about building uh, electronics in which the transistors are nanometers away. That's another 1,000 of the original closer. We're talking about putting things in our bodies that will scan us and tell us everything that's wrong with us pretty quickly. But I don't know anything about medicine. My son-in-law is, is, is a medical doctor, and I call him up when I need something. But uh, I don't know anything about medicine. But I do believe there's going to be miracles that you've never dreamed of. But, you know, I wouldn't have believed what we got right now back when I was in high school. Okay? I used to sit with my grandparents and they used to tell me what they didn't have back in 1910. They said we didn't have screen doors. <laughs> so, I don't know. Professor, if I break in here, it's only because I know that the, the authorities out at the, the desk they close? At, the, at nine, and, and they, yeah. they began to get a little. And I need to get this out of here. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that there are people going to want to distract you and ask you other things, but um, I'll recommend to my father that we find some way to um, have a sequel to this. Um, and, uh, thank you very, very much for being here. and help you if you need that. Well, I'm going to figure out how to get everything yeah. back in its place. Yeah, well, we've got to get things out of your car. <laughs> <laughs> You're right there for a little piece of